Hi, everyone. Welcome to So Fun September, our virtual edition. Uh, it's been lovely to see all of the faces in the crowds as I traveled through the stores in the South End this month. My partner this month was Charlotte, and on her way here, she had a little bit of car trouble. Um, and I had my car trouble last week, so we, uh, we've depended on uh, <laughs> our boss to help fill in a lot of, um, of our aches and pains. We will be offering the product that I'm going to show you coming up uh, at 20% off until October 10th for purchase from our website. Um, and then at that point, um, the leftover stock that's not purchased goes back to the vendors. So take advantage of that discount up to October 10th. Uh, during the live presentation today, we'll have two door prices that will be picked at random. And I'll stop and call your name out. If you hear your name, uh, please virtual message um, or private message one of our um, <laughs> one of the stores. No, private messages on Facebook. There you go. That's that's how you do it. Um, and then we will be having uh, show and tell, asking you to download your show and tell pictures to our Facebook stream. And the deadline for that is October 4th. And as those come in, we'll also be doing uh, door prizes for that. So today I'd like to start with the notions and uh, the gifts that we chose to go with this month. Some of these products are used in our samples, and some of them are just because they're our favorites. Uh, if we used it in a sample, I will point that out, and la later on I'll bring that up again and be more specific about how those items are used. So let's get started. The first item is called Face It Soft, and it's a Lazy Girl product, 100% cotton fusible, 22 by 36 inches. And this is a great stabilizer if you're doing tote bags, purses, uh, apparel. I use a product similar to this on all of my embroidery, and this gives you an extra set of threads that fuses to the back of your embroidery the base fabric and just gives you the strength and helps reduce the amount of um, puckers that you might get in a particular design. And then finally, she shows on this package that it works excellent for t-shirt quilts. So you've got a stretchy t-shirt fabric that you want to stabilize. And this is lightweight and almost uh, non-noticeable, but it gives so much support to that t-shirt uh, during the time of quilting. Now we all have our favorite friction pen. This month we have the friction highlighter. And I'm going to set this down on the table. The friction highlighter has this chisel tip which works wonderfully for marking any kind of soft and textural fabric. So I use it on batting or maybe something that's bonded with a knit, anything that's going to move under the ballpoint tip of your friction pen, you can use the friction highlighter. There are six colors available, apricot, gray, lime, light blue, red, and salmon. King Tut thread. We did uh, a Halloween project with this, and I'll be showing you those in the next few minutes. We have ebony, Irish setter, and pumpkin spice. And as I show you those projects, I'll point out which thread we used. This is my choice of thimble. I don't care for a full-fingered 
uh, thimble like a metal thimble or even a, a full encased leather thimble. I just like this dot on the tip of my finger right where the needle um, pokes and I can, I can push that needle through to do my hand binding or even needlework. Next is Magna Fingers, and this was designed by a young man, I believe he was 13 at the time, and he was looking for something to uh, help pick up fish hooks. And of course, as a seamstress, we have co-opted this to include our pins, it could be needles, anything that you lose in the carpet, and you don't want to poke your finger finding them. So they're stuck to the back of the magnet, but to release them, you're just going to open the clip and off they fall. Such a clever um, item that he has developed solely on his 3D printer. And those come in mint, violet, and blue. Password Keeper. How many of you keep your passwords in a junky old notebook like this? And you, they're not alphabetized, and I never know what I'm looking for when I need to change one. The Password Keeper has alphabetical tabs and at least 10 different sections where you can enter that all-important fabric website and change it if you need to. Wi-Fi password is on the front cover. And my suggestion is when you fill this out, use a friction pen. And then when you're forced to change your password, all you have to do is just erase the previous password and put it in again. And you haven't wasted a whole website section. Tula Pink Microtip Scissors. Nice, generous handles. A really secure silicone cap and then the sculpted tips that are sharp all the way down to the point. And these are great for doing applique, getting those last couple of threads clipped from an applique item. Uh, garment uh, grading of the seams in garments or clipping the seams to uh, make something uh, easier to stitch. And I found them really effective in cutting the jump stitches on my embroidery projects this month. So the Tula Pink 4-inch microchip scissors. And then the next three items are from a tote bag. Uh, we brought in a Lazy Girl tote bag pattern and Charlotte has used the slicker iron-on glossy vinyl on the inside so that if she suffers any spills or anything from a shopping trip, she can just go in with a wet washcloth and clean it up. This roll comes in a 17 by 30 inch um, measurement. And not only is this great for fabric, but you can use it on paper, laminate a document, or protect a recipe card. Uh, it's just like having the big old laminator in your home, but you're using this with your iron. Now be sure and use a Teflon pressing sheet when you're adhering the vinyl to any other surface. The tote bag also has stiff stuff firm in it, and it's this product which you can see has got a lot of body to it, but it's very thin and easy to work with. 
you get a 20 by 40 inch piece. It's 100% polyester, non-woven. It is washable, but it's not fusible. So it is a sew-in interfacing. And we'll show you where we use that. And then finally, we have what's called a purse zipper because it's got two poles and it's 30 inches long. You're gonna use 20 inches of this in the tote bag. And I'll explain further on how easy it is to install this zipper. We've got it in eight colors or seven, charcoal, cyclamen, black, peacock blue, royal blue, spruce, which is this one, and turquoise. So we're going to talk about our embroideries this month. And the first one is called All Hearts Come Home for Christmas. And you can see in the picture frame, Charlotte has done hers in very traditional colors. There's a small and a large format, plus there's an individual format that does a kitchen towel perfectly. I've chosen to do mine more of monochromatic. And the first one I did was on this black kind of a faux linen. Uh, this was a table runner I was able to get three projects out of. Now the designer does not give you a color chart, which is wonderful because you can either use traditional Christmas colors or something more like I've chosen. But what she didn't do is warn you that you shouldn't use that bright white swirly snow sky red in white because now you can't read the words. So uh, it's fighting with the sentiment. And when I go home, I'm going to take a black or a charcoal fabric marker and color out all of that swirly snow because it looks a lot better when the snow matches your background. It, it's meant to be textural and not a color that leaps up and, and competes with the words. So now you can really read all hearts come home for. Now this is a partial applique. The house has a little piece of fabric under it and so is the snow. It's um, a piece of fabric that you're going to trim down and then it's all embroidered around it. Our next embroidery is Trick or Treat Pumpkins by Bird Brain. And Bird Brain is known for their designs kind of open or red work like. We do have the machine embroidery and the hand embroidery pattern. So if you're ordering one of these, be sure you get the one you need. Uh, the, they're marked on the price list, ME for machine embroidery. So here is the first set, the, what I like to term the buy three pumpkins with the trick or treat written in their smiles. And this is Charlotte's pillow, and she's done this in the pumpkin spice King Tut thread. Now, what I like to do is expand my design as large as I can get it. So here's the same three guys, only as big as my machine would allow. And I've turned this into a yard stake. Uh, banner. This will be protected from the rain. It's, it's not designed to go out into the weather, but if you use that iron-on vinyl, 
you could make a weatherproof uh, flag. The next two are the by four pumpkins. And here's the wall hanging in black. And then this is my trick or treat bag. And this is stitched in black and Irish setter. And I've just used some burlap and some burlap like ribbon. And I've taken the wire out of the ribbon so I could fold it in half and stitch it all the way around. Now all of these pumpkins can be broken out singly. They're not grouped together other than those two designs. So you can stitch out them individually. This one is done with wash away stabilizer, as is Charlotte's. And Charlotte has her, her uh, kind of uh, exclusive fabric and rickrack added to the bottom to bring out the colors of the design. And then I like to do another stitch out on, say, a quilting cotton. And especially if it's a dense uh, pattern, then the quilting cotton is applied to the towel like a band of applique. And then that hides all those knots and threads, jump stitches and things on the back. So those are the individual faces from the by four pattern. The individual faces from the by three that have trick or treat written in their smiles. And this is just a, a frame I found on clearance. And it said something about your laundry. It was supposed to go in your laundry room. And so I came home and I painted out all the information on the canvas in black chalk paint. And then I created a six by six black felt square, five and a half by five and a half orange pumpkins, and then just edge stitched that to the felt, added some sticky Velcro. How many of you have a package of sticky Velcro and you don't, you can't use it in any fabric, you can't sew through it, it's too sticky. Well, I got a couple of packages and boy, I made good use out of that sticky Velcro. And there you have it, you have this little three by frame that I will change out and I'm going to bring this back in January with something for spring. So now we're going to talk about the quilt books that we did this month. And this is called Third Times a Charm Again. And for those of you who love to, to collect uh, Charm Square bundles and then you get them home and you don't know exactly what pattern you want to put them into, this is a great resource. So here's some of the examples that we've done. We are going to start with Yolanda. And you can see that it's sort of looks like airplane, airplane propellers. So I went with that theme um, and turned it into a baby quilt for someone whose room is decorated in airplanes. My propellers are kind of monochromatic, but in very uh, solid 
looking fabrics. They're actually blender fabrics, but they come off looking solid at a distance. And since I take a 3 8 of an inch bite out of the side of my quilt to create my binding, a lot of people take a quarter. I like to do 3 8 of an inch. I don't like to bind right up at the design. So in most cases, you will see that I've added background fabric all the way around the center uh, design in the quilt. Then I added the purple so that it was a, a little bit bigger baby quilt, and then the fun rainbow binding. And here is the airplane detail. And Carrie's going to come and get close up on this because the, the pattern is so cute. Airplanes and clouds. And this is just a peach batik on the back. And here are the leftover propellers and leftover purple fabric. So you can really see that airplane now. So Charlotte did the same quilt. And it's over here. And you can see that her propellers are all polka dot. She's used warm and natural and quilted this on her long arm. Creamy white background, polka dot binding, and polka dots on the back. So you can see the difference. Same pattern, but just changing the fabric a little bit, and you have a whole different look. Hers is quite whimsical and cute. And then we're going to go to this one, which is charm squares sliced into thirds. And in the book, it's called Breeze. And when you take these third pieces, then you shuffle them into a different organization. And that's the way you get the movement throughout this. Now, Charlotte has used blender fabrics and just created such a cute little runner just based on how she combined all of those sort of pastel pinks through purple shades. Now, you do notice that the bar, the horizontal bar, that caps off each one of these blocks, matches the background, matches the binding, and so the whole quilt sort of, the whole uh, strips sort of float. And she's done a, a big wide open stipple and then used another burgundy fabric for her backing. Now my breeze is down here, and it's the same idea with the horizontal bars matching the background fabric. But mine was very busy. Lots of, of charm squares with geometric shapes and then bright contrasting colors. And so instead of reorganizing those uh, in, th in threes, I chose to borrow some fabric from here, blender fabrics, and made sure that each block had at least one or possibly two blender fabrics to give your eye a rest. It was a very busy charm pack. I've done some serpentine quilting 
just a pattern off of my decorative stitches in my machine. Another decorative stitch is a little ribbon stitch and then some cross hatching in the border. And then finish this with what we call magic binding. It's a two color binding process that you apply from the back to the front and then you just stitch in the ditch. So a question has come in, what is blender fabric? A uh, blender fabric is something that from a distance looks solid, but when you get up close to it, it it's more cloudy. Um, can you see in the purple? Grunge fabric would be a good blender fabric. Um, none of these are solid. They're, they're all kind of, um, kind of cloudy. So it's anything that gives uh, a good accent to your quilt, but doesn't add a lot of visual activity. Now, Charlotte and I crossed over again. Um, no, I've shown you both, both the patterns that she and I did in common. The one that she did that's different than mine is Zelda. Many of you might take all of your scraps and subcut them down to two and a half inch squares just to have on hand. And this is a charm pack cut into fourths. So you have lots and lots of two and a half inch squares. And this is her quilt that she finished. Now, this may look random, but it's not. It actually has a plan behind it. There's a, uh, a nine patch, and then there's these bars of four, and there's, yeah, they're all bars of four running horizontally. Um, and then the nine patch gives you that vertical row. And this is a very sweet little embroidery. You can see on the green. And then she's finished it with scrappy binding. So the binding changes as it travels around the quilt. which I love. I'm going to have to try that more often. And then finally, all the way at the other end, is exclamation point. Now this is a, a charm square that's cut in half diagonally and in a, a lighter fabric inserted. And I was fascinated by how you made these blocks, but I, I didn't particularly care for the way they set them on this asymmetrical bullseye. So I got, I went ahead with the design anyway. I got my blocks ready. And I don't have a design wall, I have a design bed. And so my, my charm squares ended up on the bed and then just sort of grew into a bed runner. It was just a seamless thought process. Uh, the 42 charm squares out of the lemon uh, collection were not quite enough. I needed about 60. And so I picked up fat quarters in the blue, the green, and the yellow here at the Tuck Willis store. And here again, this is a blender fabric. Maybe you can get in. This is more like a, it looks sort of woven, but it's, it's called a blender and it doesn't add any, it doesn't shout at you like some of the yellow lemon squares do. Uh, finish it off with the polka dot border, a little more magic binding, and 
here is the lemon quilting that my quilter found. Whole lemons, leaves, and slices of lemons. I can hardly wait to get that on my bed, except now that it's fall. Um, it might have to be out for a little while. I really do like that. So we're going to move on to the next book, which is Fat Quarter Friendly Quilts. And the first one is called Roman Candle. And it's red, white, and blue with the blue fabrics, four colors in the blue fabrics. I really like Charlotte's because she's used a deeper gradation of blue. And so her candles really stand out from the background. Red border, red binding, red stars on the back. And she has quilted this with uh, red, white, and blue variegated King Tut 40 weight cotton thread. Now I'm going to stop here because we need to give away a door prize. And this is going to Diane Pelletier. Pelletier. And it's Mary Ducky. It is a sweet seasonal quilt applique design. So private message us on Facebook and we'll find out what store you normally shop in and we'll get that to you. The next quilt, 48 carats, is primary and secondary colored fabrics. Set in a, in a variegated pattern um, and they represent diamonds. Very simple block. Here is the beginning of your block with just a corner nipped out of it in background fabric. And then two log cabin strips to finish off that faceted stone look. Turquoise binding, bright yellow backing, and just a really fun quilt. You could uh, make all these blocks and, and maybe arrange them a little bit differently. Maybe you have all of them facing the same way in one row and then uh, reverse them the other. That's totally up to you. And then the two that I did, Swirls of Color. This is my favorite quilt block, card trick. But I would have never chosen those four fabrics ever, unless I hadn't, you know, I, I saw this book and I was just fascinated how they worked these colors together. So I'm going to take this down off the wall because it's quite large. The book has you do three blocks. The runner is three blocks long. So something like that. And these are my four fat quarters. I tried to kind of emulate the pattern in the book. Now on a traditional card trick, this fabric would be in here and this fabric would be in here. But in this design, they've taken that darker or lighter square and matched it with these dividing sections. And so I was having so much fun and enjoying this pattern so much that somehow it grew to five block long. 
And wouldn't this be a great bed runner if you just added kind of two beefy borders along the, the length of it? Now, I still had quite a bit of fat quarter left from those four fabrics. So at home, I have four more blocks with the green borders on either end, and someday they will be placemats. But since you can get nine blocks out of four fat quarters, that's the beginning of a small quilt. Arrange them three by three, and you don't have to do a runner. You can do any shape you want. And then finally, polka, polka dots on parade. And this pattern called for half square triangles at finished size three inches. And I wanted my quilt to go faster than that. So I got out my square up four and a half inch ruler from Quilter Select increase the size of my half square triangle block, got them all stitched, and then squared them up at four and a half inches, finished size four. So instead of six inch blocks, as the pattern shows, minor eight inch blocks. And they went together much faster and uh, I really enjoyed this predetermined fat quarter package that I bought. All of those colors were in the bundle. That's all that's left from the fat quarters. And this has got pinwheels in two corners and wide, wide borders in the other two. It's a very unique design, but I like the asymmetrical nature of it. And then I just did some almost stitch in the ditch. Um, I don't stitch in the ditch because normally I don't always hit the ditch. So I stitch at about a sixteenth or an eighth of an inch in the white background and just stitched all of those white triangles. That's, that was my quilting method. And then I carried the quilting from that line of the pinwheel straight into the border, which now creates a, a crosshatch. So it's all kind of seamless. OK, that takes care of our books. What we're going to talk about now is one more quilt design, but in a standalone pattern. And this is called Diamonds in the Sky, and it's all created with an ombre fabric. And the ombre that Charlotte and I chose to use was Stonehenge, or Stonehenge gradient. But because it fades from light to dark, um, ombre is also a term that you can, you can use. So sh Charlotte has done this one with an all over stipple and a scrappy binding where she's just used the, the extra strips from, from the diamonds. And she's bounded at the quarter of an inch so she doesn't lop off any of her tips. But my, I like my binding bigger. You can see the difference there. So I've added some background fabric to the outer uh, perimeter of my table runner. I've uh, 
picked up ideas for my quilting from Walk by Jackie Gearing, which is all about quilting straight lines with your walking foot. And so this is called the radiating quilt design. And then this would be what I consider my stipple, which is just a fill stitch. Um, and it's called shattered. So you just quilt until you feel like the area is full. And so that's, um, that's the quilting that I used outside of the diamonds. Charlotte's got a beautiful purple batik on the back. And I have more Stonehenge, this color being called Periwinkle. Now, I have some examples. I want to show you how simple this was to do. It looks extremely complicated, but if you get an ombre fabric, and this is Stonehenge in brown, light to dark, and as a quilter, we would cut strips along the edge, salvage to salvage. But in this case, you're going to buy a half a yard, and you're going to cut your strips on the lengthwise grain. So you're going to have two and a half inch strips out of the light, and then you find a, a spot in the medium that you like, and then finally out of the dark. And with those two and a half inch strips, you're going to subcut into two and a half inch squares, four and a half inch strips, and a six and a half inch strip. The first stitching that you do is the two two and a half inch squares together. And then you're going to add the four and a half inch medium. and then the four and a half inch dark. And finally, when you put the six and a half inch dark, you have created one quarter of that center block. And all you need to do is make three more. And then of course on these diamonds, you make six, three and three, and then the same in the, in the teal. All it really is, is a log cabin. But you've been very careful, almost like fussy cutting your fabric to make sure that you get the most contrast you can. And that's what creates that color movement. It's just a fascinating pattern. Very rewarding when you get it done. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, pattern from walk one or walk 2.0? Walk one. Thank you. The question was uh, the shattered, both both the uh, radiating and the, and the shattered quilting is out of the walk one book by Jackie Gehring. Um, here we have another prize winner. Nope, that's this the same one. <laughs> oh, I thought she took that away. Uh, Linda Hooper. My Green Home. This is yours. Private messages on Facebook, and we'll get this to the appropriate store. Next, we are finally going to talk about this tote bag that we've spent so much time on. Lazy Girl Harper Hold All. And I love the Lazy Girl patterns. They have great measurements, wonderful graphics. All of the fabrics are marked in different colors. So you have the right side fabric, you have the interfacing, you have the lining fabric. It's all, you can tell at a moment's notice which one you're looking at. And then she has actual photographs. And it couldn't have gone together better I really like the way she designs. 
So Charlotte's bag is out of quilting cotton. Great fun little print that she has quilted. And here are the materials that we used. On the quilting cotton and on the lining, she's used the Face It Soft to give it a little bit of body. And then I'll show you in a minute the inside. That's where the, the uh, vinyl is attached. And then finally, after you get the Face It Soft ironed on, you're going to baste the stiff stuff to the outer fabric. And this is what she's quilted through. Uh, the stiff stuff also is used in the handle. And here is that 30 inch zipper. And in a lot of bags, they will have you stay stitch at the end of the zippers, cut them off, and then they just tuck in. On this one, she just avoids that stitching through the teeth and the extra five inches on either end of the zipper are just down inside between the outer and the lining. So no cutting, no breaking a needle because you're walking over uh, teeth of a zipper. But that's the 30 inch turquoise. And here is the vinyl. Now this is strictly a tote, probably for groceries or fresh veggies or whatever, and she wanted to be able to wipe this down with a wet washcloth and clean it out if there were any spills. She did have a second package of the stiff stuff, and that's how she made the base. Two layers of stiff stuff in the base, and that just fits right in there and gives your bottom a little bit of support so it doesn't uh, sink down too far. Quilting cotton on the handles and on the little zipper ties. And it's just super cute. Now I found fabric, um, a remnant of upholstery fabric. So this is very stiff to start with. In fact, it, it had a glue back on it. So it was really meant to be put on a couch or a chair but it gave me a lot of stability. And the pattern says, if you don't need face it soft on one layer, then leave it off. And so I didn't need it on the outer fabric, but I did use it on the lining. So my lining is home, home deck fabric, and then the pockets and the handles are quilting cotton. And she's got a very clever way to do these handles. You cut the strip of stiff stuff firm, and then you do kind of a triple roll with your fabric. So you can't really feel the texture of the stiff stuff because it's got quite a few layers of the quilting cotton on it, but it still stays nice and flexible and soft. This is the 30 inch juniper zipper, the juniper colored zipper, and there's my fabric ties. Now this bag doesn't look, on the pattern, doesn't look as, it, as big as it truly is. So it's 13 inches long at the base, and then flares out to 20 up here. And I was shocked when I got this done. It was so easy, but a lot of fun. I've put in two sets of pockets, and here is my base. So uh, the stiff stuff, one package of the stiff stuff will do the entire base, walls, and bottom, plus the handles. But to do the base of it, Charlotte had a second package of the, this that she opened up and made her base. Since I only had one package, I had to find something else for my base. And so I've got a really stiff corrugated plastic that once used to be the rest of this 
for sale by owner sign. And then I have just wrapped uh, a, a fabric sleeve around it, stitched it shut, and it fits perfectly. A six inch sign just fits perfectly in the base of that bag. Now at this point, I'm gonna move over to the sewing machine During the Facebook Live May presentation, I was showing a pillow. And I got a comment later on that said, I would love to see how you do your zippers. So I'm going to show you a, a zipper demonstration that applies not only to the tote bag that you just saw, but to this pillow. And I learned this technique from one of our educators up north, Naomi, and she likes to just let her zipper show. And some of the zippers out there today are so beautiful. Like this, I mean, it goes with the silver in that fabric. And so I wanted it left uncovered. So I've got half of this done. Here's your zipper, and it's facing up, and your fabric is going to face down. And you're going to line that raw edge of the fabric up to the zipper teeth. And I put all my zippers in now with an open toe foot. And this is a six millimeter open toe foot that someone just introduced to me the other day and I love it. So we're going to do this whole zipper application with an open toe foot and not a zipper foot. Now the first thing if you were doing the tote bag and it's probably a good idea for a zipper you're going to dial your stitch length up to 5.0 which is um, a basting stitch and you're going to nestle that toe right against the teeth and what that's going to give you is about an eighth of an inch basting stitch down the length of this zipper and that's what the tote bag calls for an eighth of an inch stitch always keeping that snugged up. Now at this point you would put your tote bag lining over the other side but because it's a pillow you don't need the lining so you're going to go back to the beginning now you're going to move your needle position to the left to maybe 3 or 3.3 3. or you might be able to go a little bit further just make sure to drop your needle and make sure that you're not running into that toe and then travel back down again the toe following that the zipper teeth now, at the, I left the basting in here because I'm going to tear this apart. But at this point, you would drop that basting stitch down to a regular 2.5 to make it as strong as you possibly can. And what you've got is that open zipper. The teeth show, and that's exactly what you need for the tote bag. And if that's the look you want on the pillow, if you don't want the teeth to show, do the same technique and then just have a little bit of extra fabric on one side of the zipper and fold it over an inch or two. Stay stitch the ends and then put this right sides together with the front of your pillow. And now you have a hidden zipper. 
So both those techniques work for pillows or for the tote bags. And then finally, uh, the last pattern that we're going to talk about today is called Sewing Workshop, the Cottage Shirt. And you can see that the drawing of the shirt is not very complimentary. Uh, the silhouette of the shirt is quite boxy, but it's not like that when you put it on. So this is the first one I made would be my muslin, and I made it according to the directions, the, the correct length, and I cut out the extra large. And yes, it is boxy, but who's gonna walk around like this? So, but I did think it was plenty generous uh, underneath the arms. So the second one I made is the peach one, and this is the large. Now this pattern company is very generous with their sizing, but I always try and go a little bit bigger with something that, that the fabric doesn't matter if I, I don't like the outcome. Um, so this is the large and it's two inches longer. And I'm gonna show you with the third one that I did Now, I really like this. This is uh, called Cafe Facet Shot Cotton. And so it's, it's like a beautiful, lightweight lawn cotton. Um, so cool and comfortable. But the advantages to this pattern, number one, is this six inch hem, which gives weight to the shirt um, and just makes it lay really nicely. Plus, it gives you a smooth, uh, protected vent. Back in the old days, we'd create a vent with either a facing or a piece of binding. This vent is stitched and all folded and tucked inside that six inch hem. And then the other thing that you'll learn from this pattern is how to create this yoke with the burrito method. So back in the old days, we do our yokes with the lining fabric. And then the last thing you had to do is hand stitch that yoke down the front shoulder seam. But you get the yoke all ready, and then you roll the back and you roll the front up inside the yoke. And then the last stitch you do is the front yoke lining. And now your whole shirt is inside that little yoke section and you just pull it out. It's all stitched. You don't have to do the shoulders. They're already done. You put this little band on the sleeve so there's no sleeve to set in. And it's a really comfortable cover up whether you want to layer wear it over a camisole, a t-shirt, a tank. Um, I enjoyed it. You can see I've made three of them. And I really did like the pattern. It's, it's, um, it's more complimentary than it looks like on the pattern. Someone wants to know how tall you are. I'm 5'7". I'm um, well, maybe 5'6". I think that was maybe the lie that's on my license, my driver's license, but I'm taller than, than a, a lot of people. So the, the standard uh, size on the pattern might be right for you if you're shorter, so. Okay, that is all of the samples that we have today. Are there any more questions coming in? Okay. Um, once again, we will have um, the products available until October 10th. October 10th is the deadline to get any of these notions, 
uh, or patterns at your 20% SOFUN discount. And then uh, show and tell will be cut off on Monday at at four. No, it's the fourth. Mon that's right. Monday the fourth at I believe noon Pacific Standard Time. So anyway, thank you for joining me. Uh, I miss Charlotte today. Uh, kind of had qualms about doing this by myself, but I've been through five stores and, and 17 presentations, so it wasn't um, as stressful as I thought it would be. <laughs> anyway, thank you, and uh, don't forget to uh, tune in to us again in October. Thanks a lot.